Will you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that we can read your word, meet together as your people. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit who binds us together in fellowship with the Lord Jesus. And we pray that your Spirit who's caused these scriptures to be written will help us understand them a bit better today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what are we to say about St Mark's? Quite a bunch of them turned up today. That's really good. Uh, we've got a little description of ourselves on our website and in the pew sheet. And now we're looking for a new minister, so we've got a profile somewhere, no doubt. Uh, uh, what are we? We're a mixed group of people. We're enthusiastic about Jesus. Uh, we want to reach out for the gospel. We want to care for the poor and the needy. Well, there's all sorts of things you could say. Uh, we're active is one of the things we've got somewhere written in our literature. We're looking for a new minister. What might attract a new minister to this place? Or to say it differently, if we're looking for new people to join in, what might attract them to this place? Now, I want to suggest to you a very radical idea, which uh, you find in Ephesians chapter 3. Because Paul, in the letter to the Ephesians, reports a number of prayers that he prays for his church, his churches. And one of them here, he's praying, this is in verse uh, 19 of Ephesians chapter 3, that the church that he's writing to will be a church that f is filled with the fullness of God. How would that be? That St. Mark's is a church full of God. It's actually a bit like what's in the end of chapter 1, chapter 1 verse 23. Uh, Paul talks about the church, he says, which is Christ's body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Uh, I think that's a quite an amazing idea, don't you? It's, a, it's, a, it's a hard to grasp, perhaps, that this group of people or any other group of people gathered in the presence of Christ might be full of God. What might that look like? A family of God's people full of God. And how would it come about? And is that a good description of St Mark's? Well, a church full of God, according to this prayer that Paul is praying in chapter 3, is a church that understands God's love in practice in its relationships with each other. Filled with the fullness of God, in verse 19, is equivalent to knowing the love of Christ. But what kind of knowledge has he got in mind here? In verse 18, I think that he's talking about a corporate group knowledge knowing the love of God together as a group, as a family, as a church. He prays that they'll have the power to grasp or to comprehend together with all the saints, together with all of God's people, what are the dimensions of the love of Christ. He want, he's praying that they'll have something experienced together in their corporate life that is an understanding, a comprehension, a grasping of the love of Christ. Now, in this letter, and indeed throughout the Bible for that matter, love is not in the first place a feeling nor a sentiment. It's usually the description of action, what you do. And Paul is praying that this church, and it's a prayer that we could keep praying for this church, will experience together and so come to grasp how great is the love of Christ in all its dimensions, in its width and length, and height and depth. In other words, in all of the directions you might look, all the directions you might go with other people, all of the circumstances of your life, whether it's up or down or broadly or for a long time, you will always see and experience the love of Christ. That all of your, all of your vision and all of your action will be mediated through the love of Christ. That you will see the love of Christ in action from yourself and you will receive the love of Christ in action from other people. In whatever dimension you look, up or down or what, sideways or long ways or whatever way, always there will be, and in the, in the experience of the people together, Christ's love. That is how God is seen in a church, Paul thinks. But how might this come about? What's the method? How does it work? Well, the secret to the fullness of God's presence in the love of Christ is not what we do, 
even though I said love is an action, it starts with prayer. And you look in verse 14, this is the beginning of a prayer, another prayer, that Paul is praying in this letter. Notice who he's praying to. He's praying to the Father of glory. He's praying to the glorious Father who is full of riches, glorious riches, which in this case means power and strength. Here is a prayer for St. Mark's, is it not? This is a prayer you could keep praying for this church or other churches if you're part of another church. The prayer contains a secret. The Father of glory is the glorious Father who is full of power and strength. The Father of families, of this family, this church family here, of all his people together. And Paul prays to the Father, what for? Well, look at this. He prays that they'll be strengthened with power in their inner being through the Holy Spirit, that Christ will dwell in their hearts through faith, and that they'll have their roots and foundations in love. Now, there are two things in here. Now, Ephesians have got Paul having lots of sentences doubling up on themselves, but two simple things here. He's praying that they'll have power and strength in order to love. But the power and the strength they need to love comes only from the Holy Spirit who lives in them, from Christ who dwells in their heart. Entirely dependent on the Holy Spirit or Christ living in them. That's the secret. It's a very simple secret. You see it in verses 16 and 17. The Holy Spirit in our inner person, in our inner being. Christ dwelling in our heart. The inner being, the inner person, the person who I really am on the inside. The inner me, me in my heart and spirit indwelt by Christ himself through his spirit. Indwelt by God himself through his spirit. The Holy Spirit taking up residence in my inner being. Uniting with my spirit. How is this the case? Now notice this is a prayer. There is no instruction here. Paul is reporting his prayer. But there's an implied instruction because he's praying. The implied instruction is pray. Pray for this, that Christ, through his Spirit, will so fill and live in and dominate and change our hearts and inner beings that we will have God's power to love one another, to know that we are loved. But this starts not with the loving, but with Christ in us. It starts with the Spirit of Christ in us. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you think this is great? That God's Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus himself, would take up residence in your life. How near at hand he is. Some of us grew up with a God who was kind of black and a long way away and generally grumpy. But this God is a God who lives, is decided to take up residence in your heart and mind. Now you know that your heart's not very good most of the time, isn't it? What's God doing in your heart? Well, in some cases he's having a little tussle. Because one of the troubles about my heart is that the thing that's right at the centre of my heart, which is me, wants to stay at the centre of my heart. But I have to have Christ dwelling in my heart by faith, Paul says, because the faith in this case means my belief that he is the better boss in my life, that he's the one I should trust and obey, and so I live submitting to him as the one who lives within me as the boss and Lord of my life. There's a struggle there. But it's a struggle that we give up every day by the faith we have that he's the one who's the right to be there. And indeed, because he's there, he's the one who transforms us, doesn't he? Now, your heart may be good or bad, but it's probably better than it was a long time ago if you've been following Christ all that time. Because that's what he does. He transforms us and changes us from the inside out by his spirit. A transforming thing. And people 
like this are people who are filled with God's Spirit, filled with Christ himself. But how does Christ get into our hearts in the first place? Now in chapter 113, Paul makes it really clear how the Ephesians had this happen. He says that you were included in Christ when you believed, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed and were marked by him with the promised Holy Spirit as God's own possession. You heard the gospel, you believed it, God put his spirit on you to say that he, he owns you, you belong to him. That's where it began. It began with hearing and believing the gospel of your salvation. And I want to say to every one of you here today, are you absolutely clear that that's the case for you today? That at some point, if not maybe today, that you are certain and sure that you've heard that Jesus is the Lord who's died on the cross to save you, that you've submitted your life to him and asked for forgiveness, and you've said that from now on you will serve him no ifs or buts, and that God has given you his spirit and marked you out as his. That's the crucial beginning. Without that, nothing works. But having been begun there, then we are able to know God. And Paul goes on in chapter 1. Let me finish with another prayer here. This is chapter 1, verse 17 onwards. He prays that God, the Father of glory, will give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowing God. See, we can know God, but not know him very well. We can be true Christians, but not really full Christians still with the ABC in the kindergarten and shamefully many churches still have people who are still knowing the same things they knew 20 years ago that they learn in Sunday school and they do not know the Lord Jesus any better than they did then. Paul prays that they'll have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. They need wisdom to know what is the gospel, what is that God has said, to sort out the rubbish from what the scriptures say. Revelation, because you cannot know God unless God tells you who he is. And here are the scriptures. Paul in Ephesians has told you, God has revealed what the Old Testament was on about and now it's really clear this gospel is going to all people. Anyone who puts their life, their life in the hands of Jesus will find salvation, not just Jews. The scriptures is where you will see the revelation of God. And a famous old writer a long time ago, he says you've got Bible and knees, use them both. Read and pray that God will help you know him better, more and more. Because knowing God is the one who saved you, is the one who's marked you, who, li who lives in you, who fills you with his presence. So, St Mark's, a church filled with the fullness of God, understanding how wonderful God's love is together. That is, it's a church of people with Christ in their hearts. That is, it's a church of people with the Holy Spirit in their inner being, filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's a prayer for us to pray. Keep praying like this. The first thing is that Christ, through his Spirit, will fill our hearts with his presence, with his love, with his power and his strength. The key to the secret, the Holy Spirit in you, filling you with his presence, filling you with his power to know him and to love him. And my prayer is that we'll keep doing that and more and more we'll be filled with the Spirit of God and more and more we'll show the character of God and more and more we'll experience the love of God together as we care for one another. Now we're going to do some praying.